Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Great Ideas in Psychology. We have reached chapter seven, which is about intelligence tests. This is a topic that I find discomforting, uncomfortable to talk about, but I believe that adds to the reasons we have for talking about it. It becomes more pressing to discuss intelligence tests because of the problematic character that IQ, discourse on IQ, discourse on IQ tests have taken because of the massive influence of intelligence tests on culture, on the way we think about ourselves and other people, decisions, both personal decisions and societal decisions, decisions that are made based on this concept and related concepts and assumptions. Let's begin without further, further ado, further prefatory, prefatory remarks. So as I have indicated on this slide, instead of great ideas, in some cases, in some of the chapters, it might be more appropriate to say massively influential or massive ideas, um, or maybe more innocently innovative ideas, ideas that innovated, they were massively influential, regardless of whether or not we uh, would identify them as great at a, at a, at a philosophical, uh, through a philosophical lens. So intelligence tests. Here we are at the, on, on the general map of our series. It's a long way to go. This chapter begins with the so-called school principles question. Now the author brings in uh, this question as the motivating force behind something like IQ tests, intelligence tests. What is a principles question? Imagine that you have a great school, um, great place for learning, for not just learning through the courses, the teaching material, formal teaching material, but also great environment uh, to interact with nature, with classmates, with the architecture of the building. It's a really great place. You know, it's quite magical. <laughs> You can imagine your ideal school for yourself or for your children. The school principal's problem is that there are many student applicants. Everybody wants to come to your, everybody who knows about it and can wants to um, come to your school, but there are not enough spots. And the, the question then becomes how to select among the applicants, you know, out of all the people who want to be in your school, who apply to be in your school, how do you select? the best students. The, there are different variations on this question. This is not, this is a form of question that can show up in different ways. This is just one variation of it. You have the school again, you have already accepted uh, a group of students. They've already entered into the school, but you have two different teaching methods. And based on your limited resources, limited teaching staff, you can't put all of the students uniformly into one um, stream of teaching education. One method is more intensive <clears throat> and it involves allocating more, more resources. Presumably here, the idea is to allocate the more promising student, to assign the more promising students to the more intensive uh, educational program. So that a, raises a question, raises a problem, if you cannot do it to everyone. Now you might think that, okay, if you can't do it to everybody, then just don't do it at all. That's the fair thing to do, but let's assume the principal doesn't want to do that. The author of our textbook, Fatali Mogadam, Professor Mogadam, goes on to say the best solution to this kind of problem, which isn't possible for us, but the best solution is to have a time machine. Why? Why is it uh, the best solution to have a time machine? Because, because with a time machine, you can make one decision provisionally, you can make a decision, use the time machine to travel forward in time, see the results of your decision, and then come back to either confirm your decision or to switch your decision and so on and so forth. You can make a new decision, go forward in time, go to the future and see what happened based on your decision and then come back. You can do it if you have a time machine that works, continues to work properly. You can do it as, as often as you want, as, as many times as you want, and you will get your answers and your, um, your decisions will have the the most informed basis. It doesn't make sense to talk about time machines despite their impossibility. Why is our author talking about an impossibility, something that we read only in sci-fi uh, fiction? 
the reason we, it is useful to bring this time machine idea, the solution, is because other solutions, the actual solutions that people apply, that we have access to, other solutions are replacements for the absent time machines. That's why it's important to use that fictional instance, because that's the ideal that the actual solutions try to strive towards. In what way? In, in the sense that other solutions also rest on an, at least an implicit prediction, anticipation of the future and the consequence of the decisions that we make in the present time for what happens in the future. What is the problem with time machines or with predictions? The problem is that once you know the future or you have a prediction of the future, it changes what you do in the present, which in turn will influence the future. In one of my previous videos about prediction machines, that's a, it was a review of the book by that, by that name. Uh, there was a discussion of an app that predicts traffic on particular roads. So let's say there's a road that you want to drive to and that road, the app, the prediction machine tells you that there's gonna be high traffic in, in that road. So you get that prediction and that prediction changes your behavior, not just your behavior, but the behavior of all the other drivers who are using the same app. What happens as a result? That road is going to be that have, have light traffic because of that, be precisely because of that prediction. Because we don't just predict for its own sake, we predict in order to act based on predictions. And the school principal's predictions of the future, in, by influencing his or her decisions in the present time, influence the, the future. And it plays a role in that, uh, bringing about certain predictions and not other predictions. Now we are getting to the topic the topic of IQ tests. IQ standing for intelligence quotient. Intelligent. Uh, why is that a typo? Probably because of low intelligence. <laughs> we get the uh, line here on page 95. Intent, uh, intelligence tests, uh, intelligence quotient tests, intend to measure a person's cognitive capabilities that are independent of experience. That's a key assumption. You're measuring something that is presumably not changing, not sensitive to the child or the person's experience. If, it is, if you're measuring something that is sensitive to experience, you're not measuring IQ. You're, you're measuring uh, learning, the history of learning or something related to that. In the context of education, the history of IQ involved or included the Stanford Binet tests, uh, Weschler's tests, and these tests originally intended to estimate this, the relative, the so-called relative cognitive capabilities. Relative to what? Relative to age. So it was a very confined, very limited, very careful concept in its original form. And it had a very limited and specific uh, intentions behind it to identify children who need extra help in their education. And then this concept of relative to age is also important. So for example, when an IQ for a student, a young student is 120 and the student's age is 10 years old, that meant in that original sense uh, in the pioneers of IQ tests. For them, it meant that the 10 year old child had the mental capability of an average 12 year old student. So please pause on this I mean, not literally, you don't have to pause, but linger on, on these concepts. Average 12-year-old, that's also important. And this IQ has built into it the idea of age and its relationship to mental capability. So that's the formula for uh, calculating the IQ based on the test score. So the test score, the raw test score gives you the so-called mental age. You can question that, you can question the validity of that, but that's what it was supposed to mean. This method is no longer used. So when somebody gives uh, their IQ score, uh, publicly they say my IQ is 160. What they mean is not, they're not talking about their mental age. So that concept of age is now disentangled in our time in later theories of IQ and IQ testing. So this method of calculation is no longer with us. That original way of thinking is not with us anymore. 
but the term IQ is still with us. And that's a passage from page 96. If you turn the page, on the following page, we read this passage. Intelligence tests and the idea of IQ have popularized the notion that there is some fixed characteristic possessed by all individuals that can be precisely measured, measured anywhere in the world, rather like we measure height or weight to precisely indicate cognitive ability independent of experience. So it's a fixed characteristic. That's, that's a huge assumption. Everybody has it. Everybody has the same kind of thing that at that kind of thing only varies in degrees, not in kind. The only quantitative differences exist in that fixed characteristic, that, in that universally present characteristic. And this thing can be precisely measured. We can have better or worse measures of it, tools for measuring it, of measuring it. So to explicate that further, these are important assumptions behind IQ and IQ testing. It is possible to estimate mental capabilities that are dissociable from experience, prior education, and so forth. Now you might say, is this even possible? Don't you have to at least communicate using language, the idea of testing, sitting down to do a test, to give answers to questions that are right or wrong? All the, these concepts are concepts that children have, are, have presumably learned through language, through their education. How can you claim, how can anybody claim that these concepts, the application of these concepts, sitting down, taking a test, giving correct answers, not giving the wrong answers, is independent of language, independent of prior education? Psychologists have a trick. Every time they reach a block, they say, oh, no problem. I am going to introduce a concept that allows me to deny the, either deny the, the presence of this problem or seemingly on, on the surface offer a solution to it. So what do psychologists do? What, what, do they, what have they done? They say, oh, uh, it's not a problem. Let's define two different kinds of intelligence. Let's call them fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. And with these two definitions, the problem above is essentially solved, or you could say the problem is denied. If you define fluid intelligence as different from crystallized intelligence, then you already give yourself the gift of a concept of intelligence that is by definition independent of experience, independent of education. Wow, what a generous gift to give to oneself, this concept of fluid intelligence. Is this really a solution? You can think about that further. But these definitions, these, that these two definitions go hand in hand. Fluid intelligence is that type of intelligence that allows us to learn to solve problems that we haven't seen before. In contrast, crystallized intelligence is based on our knowledge, based on our past experience. It's crystallized and it grows with education and with, with our age. Further questions to think about arise out of the interaction between our lives, our decisions, and these assumptions that uh, I'm now questioning, we are questioning together. We make decisions based on IQ. What do people do based on IQ tests? What do educators do? What do parents do? These are things that we should continue to think about, especially if we are in a position or close to a position where we are able to make decisions and think with concepts like IQ and test these types of testing. Let's talk now a little about the history of the idea. I don't know why my cat is talking. I just, for the purpose of making the video, I usually go to my cat and I spend about 15 minutes, 20 minutes with him because I want him to be quiet during the video, but um, I can't even predict the behavior of my cat, <laughs> let alone. Uh, human children based on their IQ tests. Anyways, joking. History of the idea of intelligence begins in the modern era with Francis Galton, who was, uh, I believe, a second cousin of uh, Charles Darwin. So Galton contributed a lot to thinking about intelligence. Not all of his ideas are great. Um, they, they were all influential, but uh, not, they, they were not all good but they were not all bad. So he, dis, he introduced the idea of heritability of intelligence, brought it to the foreground. He introduced this interesting method of twin studies, twins studies, looking at psychological characteristics, capabilities of biological, biologically related, very closely related 
children, individuals who uh, were genetically close, like twins, but were raised in different environments. So twins sometimes are, are raised separate families. They're separated at, at birth or close to birth. And you can make uh, conclusions, you can make arguments based on the similarities or, and differences between twins and other siblings. Another thing he did was he linked intelligence to sensory acuity. So he said things like, people who are intelligent are more sensitive, perceptually more sensitive. So if you're in a, in a room and somebody slams the door or makes a, lo a loud noise in any other way, the person who is intelligent is going to be bothered by that more because the intellig intelligent person is also sensitive. The sensitivity, sensory acuity is the basis of intelligence, Skelton argued. And that, you know, we can sympathize with that sensitivity being related to generally in intelligent, being intelligent. Not so great. I mean, not very ethical. He also uh, argued in favor of eugenics, selective breeding of humans. Social Darwinism is, is also related to, I mean, linked to Galton's work. Social Darwinism says that some individuals or groups are better fit to survive than others. Due to many physical characteristics and psychological characteristics that we could measure, like IQ. And these, he argued, Galton argued that IQ is also demonstrated by people's wealth and achievements. If somebody is, has acquired a lot of wealth and has, has succeeded in life, that's because they are uh, naturally fit to achieve all those things. Then he had some romantic uh, ideas, some, uh, some extra ideas about intelligent people's lives. Biography, typical biography of a genius. He said that geniuses and highly intelligent people are usually good in one domain but, and terrible in most other domains. So they fail usually in their romantic relationships. They're usually isolated. That could be because of their high sensitivity to unusual sensitivity level. He also said that these geniuses are emotionally unstable and they live short lives. And this, he said, this is the kind of natural or natural justice that nature uh, nature enacts a justice on them. These are more related to anecdotal uh, observations that he had, not any systematic scientific observation. More contemporary, closer to our time, we had this, uh, especially in the United States, we had this hugely influential and controversial uh, book called the Bell, the Bell Curve, The Bell Curve, Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life. And uh, this work, this is a passage from our, our book, Great Ideas. Um, Muradam writes that this work assumes that the United States is a meritocracy, a society in which the position of individuals on the status hierarchy is determined by personal ability and effort rather than inherited, inherited wealth and privilege or being helped by other people or being systematically helped or, or hindered. To assume that one's position in the social hierarchy depends entirely or mainly on personal intelligence is to be far too reductionist and individualistic. Of course, uh, of course, this assumption serves to uphold, maintain, support the existing social hierarchy and status quo. So these are, you can see these as a continuation of Francis Galton's line of thinking. The achievement and wealth diagnostically allows us to uh, infer somebody's IQ. What does that presuppose? It presupposes generally a fair system, a fair society, where ability translates into achievement. We have this, uh, we have some relatively more famous contemporary uh, in researchers on IQ. One of them uh, was Lewis Terman. Lewis Terman did a massive study uh, of IQ uh, in California. He did research on more than a thousand, almost 1,500 children uh, in California in the 1920s. And what he did was he wanted to keep track of the highly intelligent people in that, in that sample. So he selected the top 1% based on their IQ. The IQ scores of those top 1% was between 135 and 196. And what Terman did was he contacted them once every seven years. What did he observe? He found that 
these high IQ individuals were were at a better place. They were at a better had, at better states, both in terms of physical maturity and social maturity. So both types of maturity, social, physical, psychological, correlated positive, positively in term and study with IQ. He observed that these intelligent uh, individuals produced more books, articles, poems, short stories, patents, etc. They had job satisfactions uh, on average and marriage satisfactions. And they also lived longer, contrary to what Galton predicted. Of course, IQ was not the only predictor it was also important what kind of education they received, these kids, these individuals. The quality of education was important. Another thing that was important was motivation. Something else Terman observed was a gender bias, which means that almost all women in his sample became housewives. This is a very obvious, clear demonstration of systematic you know, bias in favor of one group of people and against another group. So it doesn't matter it, at that time, in that setting, for Terman's participants, research subjects, doesn't matter what your IQ score is, as long as you are female, your job is most likely a housewife. A major flaw in Terman's study was that he intervened with the lives of his research subject. He helped them. When they asked the Professor Terman for recommendation letters, he gave recommend, glowing recommendation letters for, to, for them to get into college universities and get jobs. Is that fair? Is that a, an objective, distant, detached, unbiased research uh, project? If you help the people that you're observing, you're keeping track of them? So that's a, that's a big flaw. This is uh, related to, to the, the things I said about the time machine and the predictions. He already wanted to see some, some things in the in his data, and he helped bring about those observations. What can we say about IQ and genetic determinations? This is a big topic. I'm only going to rely on the present text that we are reading now. And there, there is a very brief quote related to this, the link between genetics and IQ. Here we read the, the fact that there are only about 22 to 25,000 protein coding genes in the human genome, and these are far too few to suggest that genes determine intelligence. Another uh, study that is relevant to the link between genetics and IQ was conducted by Turkheimer and colleagues. What they found was that herit heritability of IQ scores seems to be high in high socioeconomic status populations. So if you give children all the necessary support then they can, they seem to be able to inherit the IQ from their parents. But you have to give them an environment in which that heritability can express itself. But that, the correlational heritability, correlation with intergenerational correlation, is low, very low, in the low socioeconomic status population. That means that the gene IQ connection requires environmental support. Even if we assume that there is a link between genetics and IQ, there's no guarantee. It, the guarantee comes from that connection being supported by the environment. The link between IQ and genetic determination is also related to the link between IQ and the brain, brain structure, brain function. This is a recent contribution in that line of thinking by, uh, this is a book by Richard Heyer, uh, published in 2017, uh, around 10 years before, Richard Heyer, uh, with a co-author, wrote this paper about the same idea, the parietofrontal integration theory of intelligence. And this was based on 37 studies that he reviewed. And he, based on these studies, he argued that there is a network, uh, the distributed network in the brain, consisting of parietal and frontal regions of the brain. And the functions of these networks are intelligence. They are, when these areas of the brain function, the expression of that functioning in behavior is intelligent behavior. So performance on IQ tests is supported by a wide network of brain areas and their connections. These areas included, just for your information, Richard Heyer is not included in our textbook. Um, 
I just included it because of their relevance. Just to tell you that these uh, these discussions are still alive. There, there, there are still researchers doing um, make, pursuing questions and doing research on IQ and its relation to biology, genetics, and the brain. So they include they, these brain areas related to IQ include parietal areas, frontal areas, arcuate basilicus, the white matter fibers that connect posterior to anterior areas of the brain. Um, and this is just the, the citation for the paper that I, I told you about. The arcuate, uh, the arcuate facilicus was also found to be important, an important area in, in another study by Privato and colleagues published in Neuroscience in 2017. And uh, there was a relationship between these white matter connectivity uh, areas and uh, scores on openness. And you might have heard the, the relationship between openness and IQ. Many people have argued that openness and IQ are, they overlap uh, a lot. So just extra extensions. I don't want to necessarily say support, but they're extensions and further fleshing out, empirical fleshing out of the idea of IQ and um, its brain basis. Now, this paper by Rex, uh, this paper by uh, Rex Young and Richard Heyer, when it came out, it came out in a journal called Behavioral and Brain Sciences. What is special about this journal is that every major article that is published here is followed by a whole bunch of commentary, shorter commentaries on these articles. That's what makes this journal important and interesting because you get a plurality of perspectives and responses. But one of the people who responded to Young and Heyer was Robert Sternberg. And Robert Sternberg gave a critical response to the, to the Target article and said essentially that Jung and Heyer have done an admirable job of solving the wrong problem. What does that mean? What did Sternberg mean? These are a summary of Sternberg's points. He said that first, intelligence is not in the brain. Intelligence is not something you can look for in the brain. Intelligence from the perspective of evolutionary adaptation doesn't even require a brain. Think about cockroaches or bees. The type of brain that we have is one biological basis to intelligent behavior, for intelligent behavior. It's not the only one. So to attach intelligent behavior to brain, is, uh, it shows a very limited view. Then Sternberg went on to say that people assume there is one single human capacity. Is this even a valid construct? That's up to debate. This, this human capacity it is, is named general intelligence. And just because we give it the name, it must be real, right? And so it's a single human capacity. It's, it has a name and it's measured by IQ tests. If you step back and reflect on this, uh, on this line of thought, where is IQ in the brain? This question doesn't make sense. Because as we said, IQ is not in the brain, doesn't require a brain. It is not in the, in the brain like being in a container. Fifth point is that the question that Higher answered or Jung and Higher answered is this question. Where are brain areas whose activity correlates with performance in conventional IQ tests? So just when you say, where, which brain areas fire when you are solving um, a cross, crossword puzzle. Which brain areas fire or increase in their activity when you're walking? Which brain areas fire when you're juggling? Which brain areas fire when you're solving math problems? Those are specific activities. And one specific activity is doing the test, doing the conventional IQ tests. And which areas of the brain are active when you're doing those tests? That is the answer. That, that is a question that Higher has given an answer to. This is a very different question compared to where is IQ in the brain? That big question, that very seemingly very ambitious, very general, very penetrating question is very different from this more modest, more limited in scope question. But this question, number five here, Sternberg points out, this is a more accurate representation of what the researchers have done. Yes, it is less ambitious. It is a smaller accomplishment, but this is the better representative of what has happened. 
Then we come to, you know, one of the last things I should mention, I should include in this presentation is the discussion of one versus multiple intelligences. Here's a relevant passage. The general association between different types of abilities was interpreted by Spearman as indicating quote unquote general intelligence indicated by that small g. But the association between different types of abilities is not perfect. Different types of abilities don't correlate always perfectly. They don't correlate systematically. So somebody who's good at dancing might not be good at uh, analytic thinking or solving math problems. Somebody who's good at solving math problems is not necessarily good at sports or doing martial arts or dancing. Somebody who's a musical genius is not uh, necessarily going to be good at gardening or, or having an intu intuitive grasp of uh, dealing with plants, with, with natural, natural things. So that's the division between looking at intelligence as one general capacity that then divides itself or is divided depending on the context and tasks versus different capacities that from the outset are distinct from each other. Multiple intelligences, this is uh, one of the major proponents of this idea with, uh, has been Howard Gardner, include naturalistic intelligence, intrapersonal intelligence, logical mathematical intelligence, verbal linguistic intelligence, interpersonal intelligence, bodily, musical, visual, pictorial intelligence. And you can think about examples of this, people that you know in your life, somebody who's very good at reading their own emotions, reflecting on their own psychological experiences, intra, having a high intrapersonal uh, intelligence skill, but not be, being very good at other tasks listed here, vice versa. Somebody who is really good at interacting with other people, but they don't have the same level of self-awareness. This is a huge assumption now. It's I, something that I cannot emphasize enough. Single intelligence theorists insist that to measure IQ, you need to isolate the person from the natural environment, take them into a lab or into a classroom, into an office. You have to take the person out of their natural environment when they normally are, when they want to, where they want to be, the, the, their own place. And in that isolation, you can figure out their general intelligence, their small g, their, uh, their one general intelligence. By contrast, the theories of multiple intelligence or multiple intelligences theorists insist on looking at people in their natural settings, where the person wants to be, where the person inclines to be, where the person wants to spend time on. If you allow the child, the person, the teenager, if you give them enough freedom, if you give, if you give them enough option, where do they want to spend time? With what do they want to spend time? What do they want to do? What do they want to play with? What kind of play, what kind of activity they want to do? Where, what is that activity that they just lose time, lose track of time when they do that activity. That is the expression of their particular intelligence, what they are prepared to, to be good at. Finally, we should note the relationship between relationships and intelligence. How many students thought they were not good at studying, they were not good at school until a teacher told them that they are good, that they can be good? I don't know how many, but I'm sure there are countless of, countless cases of people who didn't believe in themselves, didn't believe that they have any, any skills, any particular skills, anything that they want to spend time on, anything they want to develop a passion for or develop advanced skills in until a teacher, an older person, a guide came to their lives and told them that this is possible. Here, uh, our author says, when teachers expect higher performance on the part of particular students, those particular students do perform better. Does this really fit with that IQ uh, concept as something that is irrelevant of past history of learning, uh, experience, relationships? You can isolate the person and still get uh, their estimate, get an estimate of their intelligence. Compare this with the placebo effect. You know, when you believe something, it has an effect in what you do. It's a behavioral placebo effect. We will compare this with another chapter in the future on uh, the zone of proximal development and Lev Vygotsky. But that's a discussion for the future. The next thing we will talk about in this series is 
the idea of artificial intelligence, what it is, its relevance to psychology, is it a great idea in psychology, how we should think about it, how we can think about it, and so forth. Thank you so much for your attention. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit my Patreon page. Please like, comment, subscribe um, if you are interested, if you enjoy the, the videos. Um, otherwise, hope you like the video and I, uh, I will speak with you in the future. Thanks.